Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we gathered on tonight, the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present this evening. This has been a place of teaching and learning for many thousands of years, and UNSW is honoured to continue that tradition, and that's what we'll be doing tonight. I want to thank you all for attending. It's wonderful to see you here. I want to actually say hello to dear friends and colleagues who are in the audience as well. Um, this is the fourth public event around the recommendations of the very ambitious yet influential and significant review to achieve excellence in Australian schools, more commonly referred to as Gonski 2.0. I will be your chair tonight. My name is Lila Malachik and I'm someone who's been in education for 36 years. 34 of those years are in schools. Um, my bio, I think, is on the website if you want to read more. So we'll just leave it at that. You will note, of course, that I'm not Adrian Pickley, who was advertised as the chair. He does send his apology with explanation. Adrian and his dear wife, Sonia, are parents who balance work, and family, family life between Sydney and regional New South Wales. So tonight, Sonia actually had a commitment that was really non-negotiable. So Adrian has been working all day here and has now flown back to Griffith to be with his young sons, which is wonderful. Tonight, our, at this public event, our expert and our experienced panel members, absolutely no pressure on them now, <laughs> and along with you during um, Q&A sessions, will be addressing how will we support and value the profession. It's recommendation 10 from the Gonski 2.0. Now, I don't need to read it to you because you now have a visual, as any good education, uh, educator would do. Are you taking a photo of me, John, or of the slide? Thank you. <laughs> But certainly, whilst you read Recommendation 10, there is far more within the report around that, and I'll just read you an expansion on that as well. That teacher collaboration occurs in many forms. However, not all types are equally effective, and I think we know that as quality educators. Active collaboration, such as peer observation and feedback, coaching, mentoring, team teaching and joint research projects allow teachers to learn from each other and typically has a positive impact on students. In contrast, collaboration that concentrates on simply resources, planning activities or sharing administrative issues has little or no positive impact on student achievement and student learning. And that will be, along with the recommendation, the underlying principles of what you will be hearing from the four panel members. Most recently, we had um, Dr. Michelle Jones and Dr. Alma Harris out here, um, and they were doing ro road shows around New South Wales, which was wonderful. But some of their more recent work is absolutely supporting the premise that the most powerful work you can do as a school leader or as a school or an educator in schools is to generate authentic and real collaboration in your school. And we must think about that. For systemic success, we need to deliberately identify and work on that, not just sharing it, but collaborating, and that's how we will get scalable success, which is really important. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the panel members to you. And I would like to also state, editorialising, that it's an honour for me because I know all the panel members, I respect them, I like them, and I have or I do collaborate with them on many different projects over the short 36 years that I've been in the game, which is wonderful. Their fuller biographies are on the UNSW Gonski Institute website. I would, I would access that if I were you. I'm going to introduce all four of the panel members in one go so that then you can hear from the experts in this field. 
So our first speaker will be Dr. Tracy Dirksen, who joined education in UNSW in, in 2016 as Vice Chancellor's postdoctoral research fellow. Her research focuses on professional learning and teaches interpersonal skills, their motivation and engagement. Her program of research includes situational judgment tests to help assess and promote the development of other attributes such as empathy and adaptability. Tracy has completed her PhD in educational psychology, a Bachelor of Arts Honours in Psychology, a post degree Bachelor of Education and a Master of Arts in Educational Psychology. She has also worked as a primary school teacher, and she is fun despite what I just read. Michelle, <laughs> Michelle Hostrup is the principal of Daceyville Public School. Michelle has been a teacher and a school leader in London and Sydney for over 15 years, working in multiple different settings, primary, special and high school, I believe. Is that correct? No? Not high school. <laughs> <laughs> she is committed to leading school improvement through contextualised, long-term professional learning programs. She is passionate about engaging teachers in sustainable innovation and quality teaching practices. Cathy Deacon is currently the New South Wales Teachers Federation Director of the Centre of Professional Learning. Cathy was the principal of Villawood East and Canterbury Public Schools and was a New South Wales Federation State Councillor and one of the four Vice Presidents of Federation. I may add that um, Cathy has had numerous roles on executive in the Federation and I can't think of one that you haven't actually populated, Cathy, so thank you for that. Cathy has extensive knowledge and experience in curriculum and professional matters. Last but definitely not least, nor the quietest, is Dr Tony Lachlan. He's a senior lecturer and academic director of professional experience in the School of Education at the University of New South Wales. Prior to this appointment, he was director of professional experience in the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney. His research interests lie in teacher professional learning. He is currently engaged in two projects that are integrating the concept of teacher collective efficacy with emerging leaders, as well as within the context of the entrepreneurial education. Each um, panellist will speak for about 15 minutes. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so I ask you now to start forging those exploratory questions that will put the panellists on edge, but will certainly get us the information that we want. So may I invite Tracy up as our first speaker. Thank you so much, Tracy. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much for that introduction. Um, what, can you hear me all right? Back there, all right. Um, well, I'm gonna use my 15 minutes uh, to share what drives my research and how I think we can better support our teachers and increase the value of the teaching profession along the way. And so I'm gonna be reading a bit because I've done a lot of thinking through this as in preparation and, um, and I, yeah, I think that we'll all probably write a paper together or something on this. So I'll just read and I can make these uh, notes available to you after if you're interested and with references and all of that. Um, so what does drive my research? Well, um, as mentioned, I was a primary school teacher and I really enjoyed it, uh, partly because my young students were so inquisitive. Uh, together we looked for answers to new questions each day. Um, and like many of my students, I often pose questions, a lot of those why questions. And so one example is why did I become a statistic by leaving the teaching profession after three years? So we often hear those uh, you know, tough statistics about the uh, attrition rates of beginning teachers within the first three to five years. So despite my enthusiasm and passion for teaching, I struggled professionally to just survive. And by all accounts, I was an effective teacher, so why was I unable to persevere past that beginning phase, often known in the literature and in practice as that survival sink or swim phase? To begin, to begin with, I wondered about those resources or extra supports that were missing from my work environment and whether they would have helped me with the demands I experienced as a beginning teacher. I was told on that first day by an administrator 
Our school, our school currently lacks the resources to offer you extra support as you go through your first year as a teacher. You will be on your own, sorry. So I wonder, would an induction program or mentor have helped pull me in from treading water, um, being lost at sea, you know, all those water references we hear. <laughs> um, but despite my school's lack of formal resources, I did find informal support through my fellow teachers and staff who were amazing and I still remained inspired and keep in touch with them today. So although beginning teacher attrition rates are a cause for concern, experienced teachers are also leaving the profession while citing personal and professional dissatisfaction. When examining attrition rates across career stages and seeking, seeking ways of retaining quality teachers, educational researchers often focus on working conditions and teachers' characteristics or personal attributes. So given the multiple and reciprocal influences that contribute to the complexity of teaching, I recognize that working conditions such as limited professional resources may have been one factor that hindered my commitment to a long career in teaching. Yet teacher characteristics are more often cited as factors influencing a teacher's commitment and engagement in the profession. So for example, some may have questioned whether I possessed the grit necessary for sustained engagement as a primary teacher, or maybe I held an implicit theory about my ability to teach that negatively impacted my self-concept. Uh, there's also the possibility that a combination of increased work stress and decreased confidence, or that efficacy, teacher self-efficacy, influenced my commitment, which is also a common occurrence among beginning teachers. And although I had the academic skills for teaching, maybe I had entered the profession already weak in some key personal or non-academic attributes like resilience and adaptability. And despite being motivated by altruistic and intrinsic reasons such as a desire to help children learn, maybe I was feeling ill-prepared to cope with the social complexities and cultural realities in my own classroom. Teaching really does put your interpersonal skills to, through, to the test through the many social interactions we have with students, with parents, with other teachers and school staff, administrators, external agencies. It's a, it's a full job. So overall, it is these interrelated uh, examples of factors related to a teacher's personal and job resources that drive my research. I am passionate about identifying ways in which the teaching profession can help teachers to not only persevere in a demanding work environment, but flourish when, while feeling supported and valued. The ideal, highlighted by recommendation 10, is a call to action for the system to be one that promotes optimal conditions and developmental opportunities, a system that supports and develops quality teachers who engage in quality teaching and in turn consistently influence and, is inf and be influenced by their students' learning. So this discussion we're having this evening is critical because in order to promote what is best for students' learning, we need to support the teachers who are in constant contact with students. And that is a key point um, that I've held on to by uh, Dennis Shirley, who is a uh, champion of teachers and, and educational change in this area. So therefore, I believe we need to respond to recommendation 10 through two key, two ambitious areas. Uh, number one, supporting the development of pre-service and beginning teachers' collaborative capabilities and characteristics needed for collaboration. And number two, encouraging statewide collaborative networks that in turn influence teachers' self and collective efficacy. And that's those motivational beliefs associated with a teacher's confidence in their own and in the collective's capability to influence student learning. So number one, initial teacher education. So like many in this room, I argue that to better support and value the profession, we need to start in initial teacher education and right at the beginning. Each developing teacher is influenced by ongoing interrelationships between their personal factors and their professional learning experiences. And that teacher education degree is the key first phase in a trajectory of lifelong learning. My experience as a beginning teacher and the associated, feel, associated feelings of emotional labor, something that's thrown around to define teaching, um, after three years was rich with themes of teacher burnout, stress, and anxiety, all important areas of research aimed at improving teacher well-being. But a deficit model is not the only way to enhance teacher well-being. We also need to combat the potential for teacher isolation and isolated practices with an emphasis on effective collaboration. And to do that, researchers, like myself, uh, suggest using motivational theory and research to study and contribute to evidence-informed teachers' professional learning. 
And while there is an increased awareness about the benefits of collaboration on teachers' learning and practice, factors related to isolation still exist when professional learning opportunities are disconnected from a school's culture and when there is little coordination between pre-service and practicing teachers' learning beyond this typical professional experience or practicum model. Since teachers' motivational beliefs, like collective efficacy, can influence student outcomes, it is critical that our teacher education programs help develop and link collective and collaborative skills and characteristics right from day one. It is not enough to focus on the how and when of collaborative professional learning, as we've already heard, not all types are equally effective, um, but there is also needs to be an intentional and explicit opportunities for our pre-service and practicing teachers to understand who they are within the profession and what they can offer and gain through collaboration. So therefore, we need to be promoting and developing a collaborative culture early in initial teacher education programs, beginning with an understanding and development of those key personal or soft skills required for effective teacher collaboration and effective teaching overall. So by identifying, developing, and assessing such personal attributes deemed necessary for all teachers, like empathy and adaptability, we can better prepare pre-service teachers for a range of collaborative learning opportunities that extend beyond the professional experience model and lead to the improvement of student learning. So this is the deriving force behind my program of research. But number two, statewide networks. So by investing in a range of cross-career stage collaborative professional learning, I believe we can help promote the retention of high-quality teachers needed for a range of contexts and student needs in New South Wales. And so speaking of contexts, if you may have noticed my Canadian accent so far, I thought I would share a bit about what I learned in Canada while doing research with the Alberta Teachers Association. So as we know, the teaching profession offers and often mandates opportunities for teachers to learn how to teach their students more effectively. So teachers' professional learning, commonly known as teachers' professional development, includes formal and informal professional activities that center on enhancing teacher effectiveness. The phrase professional development is often used when referencing activities that are arranged for teachers, while professional learning places the focus and responsibility for learning on teachers and their evolving needs. So while doing research in Alberta, professional development was commonly discussed as a wide range of programs or activities that teachers undertake to further understand the nature of teaching and learning, to enhance professional practice, and to contribute to the profession. And in my research, I also came to appreciate the process-oriented definition of professional learning posed by other educational researchers. And that is that it's a complex process which requires cognitive and emotional involvement of teachers individually and collectively. It involves the capacity and willingness to examine where each one stands in terms of convictions and beliefs, and the perusal and enactment of appropriate alternatives for improvement or change within particular educational policy environments or school cultures. As I mentioned, I will share my notes if you want, if you like that definition. Um, so through our discussion this evening, I will be interested in how we talk about professional learning. For example, do we highlight fre frequency and format, such as formal, informal, receptive, constructive, teacher-initiated, mandated, or do we focus on the people involved, the individual or the collective, and the type of activity taking place, such as online coursework, mentorship, professional learning communities, models for curricular and instructional changes, uh, traditional workshop models, such as conferences. All of these can can be used to help better support our teachers, but as set by recommendation 10, a focus on collaborative professional learning is essential and is backed up by research. So although educational researchers have found that professional learning activities of different types and formats can have an impact on teaching performance and confidence through professional responsibilities and instructional domains, less is known about the impact on teacher motivation. Given that teachers' motivational beliefs may act as a barrier or positively influence their successful professional learning, more research is needed. And that is why I'm here as a researcher. <laughs> um, so while a range of teacher belief systems can influence motivation, I have focused on efficacy beliefs in my research because they are considered critical and are action-oriented. So thanks to a fellow Canadian, Albert, Albert Bandura, a theoretical hero of mine who is widely described as uh, one of the greatest living psychologists, because he's in his 90s right now, uh, we recognize the important role of efficacy beliefs in all facets of life, but particularly in education. 
and he was born in Alberta as well. Just a little side note. Um, teacher self-efficacy, he says, is the belief a teacher has about their capabilities and their confidence in their capabilities to influence student learning. And that is one of the key motivational beliefs influencing teachers' professional behaviors. Teacher self-efficacy also influences a teacher's persistence, enthusiasm, job satisfaction, and student engagement. Research has found that teachers with high self-efficacy approach professional learning experiences more positively and confidently. So therefore, we need to consider efficacy beliefs to be both a product of and a constructor of teachers' professional learning experiences. And likewise, a teacher's collective efficacy, their beliefs that their school staff as a group is collectively able to influence student outcomes, even in challenging conditions, is also considered an important area of research given the established relationship to student achievement and academic climate, even after controlling for prior student achievement and demographic characteristics such as socioeconomic status. So overall, teachers' efficacy beliefs and professional learning together present really researchers with a complex relationship to investigate, one that includes connections to other factors such as work engagement and effective teaching. So not surprising, research has found that those with the highest self-efficacy are mid-career teachers. Therefore, key leaders in the area of professional learning, such as Andy Hargraves and Michael Fullen, call for an urgent investment into the professional learning of the mid-career teacher, that oft-forgotten yet dream teacher of the middle, they say. It is proposed that their confidence, their high self-efficacy, has the power to increase the collective efficacy and consequently the professional capital of a staff that has a range from early to late career teachers. And this can be done by moving beyond initiatives and focusing more on networks and processes. For example, there are research-based recommendations that we can take from the professional learning successes of the Alberta Initiative for School Improvement, AC. And although it has the word initiative in it, after their 14 years, they realized it was more of a network and a process. This has been called a shining star in the sky of global large-scale school improvement, according to Pazzi Salberg, one of our Gonski Institute members. So AC was collectively designed by all Alberta's major educational authorities and resulted in over 1,800 teacher-led action research professional learning projects that were collaborative, embedded, localized, and supported by the government with a hefty amount of time allocations and money. They were done in three-year cycles, and it was funded for 14 years and aimed to improve student learning at the local level. That was always the, the focus. The change architecture of this, of AC, was defined by four features, which I think is really good for us to think about. Vertical, lateral, radial, and temporal. So vertical meaning top down and bottom up, lateral project to project, school to school, radial outside in and inside out research expertise and practitioner inquiry, and temporal connecting medium term and longer term perspectives. Successes of AC included increased student achievement, teachers improved understanding of pedagogy, a move towards co collective peer learning through the development of curricular resources, and overall improvement of teachers' morale and skills and increased teacher professionalism. So therefore, I believe that the six recommendations set out by the AC research team can help formulate our action-oriented response to recommendation 10. Number one, plan for preservation. Number two, identify the purpose and focus on innovation and renewal as well as improvement. Number three, measure impact as a system. Number four, engage the local culture and community by widening the scope of local project partners. And that's an important one that, that AC um, really highlighted they would like to do better and that's something I think we could really do well. Invest in long-term structures and prior prioritize flexible funding. That's number five. And number six, make teacher leadership development a priority. So overall, <laughs> that's my ambitious <laughs> plans. <laughs> so overall, the results and review of AC encourages us to move away from being driven by projects and initiatives and more into an embedded and continuous change process. 
Invest in more flexible planning and development and less on predictable and time-bound funding cycles. Encourage a statewide network of improvement and innovation instead of a collection of disconnected projects. Embrace a change process that balances and in integrates bottom-up and top-down dynamics, but also providing the structure for that peer-driven lateral process. And to develop a strategy to not only spread and embed <laughs> existing knowledge, but also one that creates new knowledge set on enhancing improvement, implementation, and increased innovation. And I believe some of that is already happening here. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from our fellow panel members so I can learn more about the Center for Professional Learning and to hear about the great things happening at Daisyville. So I look forward to being challenged through our discussion tonight on where we should go from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. And may I now invite Michelle up? No. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Michelle. I'm the principal at Daisyville Public School, which is just down the road from here, so it's very convenient for me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about collaboration projects that I've been involved in and I'm currently involved in at my school. Um, when I read this uh, Gonski recommendation, I was really excited. I think it speaks to practices that are currently happening in schools and in the wider system. And I think beyond that, it sets up um, these practices as something really important and it provides kind of an imperative for us as a system to be thinking about collaboration and what that looks like. So I'm going to talk a little bit about things that I've been a part of um, and then the things that I've noticed that worked really well at that as collaboration, but also some of the things that I think we need to be thinking about. Um, and what I really loved in Tracy's talk was the sorts of things that she's talking about from a research perspective are the things that I feel like, you know, I've experienced here and where, where we go to next. So that was lovely to hear. Um, I think, though, um, the, the difference is at the moment we're not at a place where we do have embedded collaboration like Tracy was suggesting. We are very much at a short-term project-focused um, level of collaboration, particularly um, across schools. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've been a part of. Um, one of them was the Eightsville Learning Frontiers project, which happened about five years ago now, involving schools from New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria and Queensland. Um, working across sectors as well. So it wasn't just New South Wales Department of Education schools, it was schools from the Catholic system and the independent system as well, working together around specific themes and design principles. From that work, um, the New South Wales Department of Education funded system leadership grants, which um, for us, we were able to continue our work um, from the Learning Frontiers project. I know I've seen John Go in the audience here and I know he had one of those and he was able to work with schools in a rural setting as well. It provided funding and it provided support for those sorts of things. And we also hear a lot about community of schools and different networks that are being set up at the moment. So I know lots of um, schools function within a community of schools program and I know there are other things happening like the big schools network. So I feel like at the moment there are lots of things happening um, within the system that is is heading us in this direction um, and there's lots of learning experiences happening at the moment as well that's helping to set us up hopefully for the future. Um, in terms of the Learning Frontiers program, some of the things that worked really well for that was that um, it was based, first of all you had to apply to be part of it so you were working with a coalition of the willing, schools that were really interested in the work that they were doing and really looking to extend that work to share it to refine it, to evaluate it, and then to scale it and see what would work across a number of different settings. And that was incredibly exciting. So for me, at the time, I was in a really small inner city school. I got to work with really large schools um, in less metropolitan areas with very different communities to mine and see if some of the things that we were trying in my school would also work in those settings. And that was really exciting to see. And it helped us to get feedback um, and lots of different things. I think the other thing that helped us was that we had, um, we were starting from a common ground. So we, we applied for this, we went for it, and we, we had a baseline. So we weren't starting from scratch, we weren't starting from multiply, multiple different perspectives with lots of different goals. We had a really clear common goal, which was around um, future focused practice and innovative principles. But we also had these four design principles that helped to focus our work. So we actually developed a common language that we could work with, um, and that helped us to figure out you know, what was working, what wasn't working, and to evaluate our practices. And I think um, 
that when we come to collaborate, we need to think about the starting point. And if we had have been schools that were coming from really not just different communities, but really different experiences and really different practices, the collaboration would have been really hard. So having that kind of common understanding, that common baseline was it was a great starting point for us. Um, in terms of the, the systems leadership work, again, we it was even more common because we were starting from a project that we already had and we were able to bring other schools on board, which was exciting, but within that had its own challenges. And I think part of the collaborative process for us was around establishing frameworks and scaffolds to make sure that that work was able to continue, that we didn't end up starting from scratch every time we had a meeting with people from different schools. We had to have really clear expectations. Um, and I think that um, was a really important thing in terms of being able to evaluate and refine what we were doing. So making sure that we had timelines, that we had scaffolds, that we had frameworks, that we had language, um, but also that we had time to be together to build the relationships that enabled us to have those conversations. So there were lots of different things that led to um, the collaboration being effective. Sometimes we had um, external people come in to ask us questions around what it was that we were doing, why were we doing it that way, to help move the thinking forward as well. So not only were we drawing on different schools, but we were drawing on people outside of our experience. You could see things from a different perspective. And I think the exciting thing about this, part of the other thing, I, I love the idea here of the um, joint research projects, was that um, we were able to write case studies and we were able to publish them. And, and for teachers, it's not very often that you get the chance to engage in that kind of level of work. You know, we, we really are working kind of on the day to day. And I think this speaks to a bit of a shift in, in how the profession is able to view itself, but also um, how the profession is viewed. So we're seeing teachers as experts of learning, of what goes on in schools, and with the capacity to advise each other and to bring practice on. So not relying on going off to whiz bang conferences all the time or paying lots for people to come in, but actually building, as Tracy was talking about, on the mid-career, what did you call them? Yeah, the, the dream. The yes, dream teacher. <laughs> the dream teacher <laughs> of the middle. So seeing that expertise and really valuing it and being able to work with it and build on it, I think is incredibly powerful um, and very exciting. Um, in my current school, and I, I think just to, to speak a little bit about um, what Tracy also spoke about, those projects were time bound. So we were funded, but then the funding ended. And actually within a school, it's really hard to then continue doing that work because your funding is tied to other things. So I think as a system, that's something that's really important for us to consider if we are thinking about collaboration in a really long-term meaningful way. Um, I currently teach at a Department of Education primary school, which means that we are eligible for some funding called Quality Teaching Successful Students Funding. Um, I love that bucket of money. It's very exciting. Schools have a degree of flexibility with what they can do about it, the focus being on improving teacher practice and what happens in the classroom and ultimately improving student outcomes. At Daisyville, we've used that in a number of different ways. So um, one way is I um, offer teachers the opportunity to put in an expression of interest to work on a particular project that they were interested in exploring further. So something that they had trialled in their classroom that maybe they wanted to spread across the school, something that they wanted to work on and really investigate. Um, so we've got teachers, one teacher is working on feedback processes and working, trialling different things in her own classroom, using some of that time to do research, using some of that time to go into other classes and test them, to team teach, to mentor, um, and that's been really exciting. Another teacher is um, trialling philosophy for children in our school to see if that's something that will work in our community. Um, and another teacher was working on looking at how we um, engage students in outdoor learning opportunities. All of those processes, again, had a scaffold and a framework with them. So by teachers um, doing an expression of interest, they had to identify who they were working with, what was their process going to be, how would it work, what evidence are they gathering, all of those sorts of things. So the collaboration was deliberate. It wasn't just a, hey, we'd love a gardening program, off your toddle, bring me back a good gardening program that has everyone involved. Um, there's a process to it. And I think um, that for effective collaboration for this sort of thing, um, we need to make sure that that process is embedded from the beginning. If we want to make it meaningful, if we want to make it powerful, we have to make sure that we are supporting it and scaffolding it for teachers. Um, the other thing um, we do is we have, um, I've just made up names of things, so we have the special projects and we also have the stage release time, um, where teachers could offer um, to work with a partner in their stage. I've got one cross-stage team. 
So they were buddying up to work on something that either they, in their own practice, had identified they wanted to explore a bit more, or as a stage, they'd identified that actually we need to think more about, for example, one team is looking at differentiation in maths. So they work together. They um, have a week off for one of them. So that will either be they might go into the other person's classroom and say, actually, I'd like you to observe how I set up the differentiated activities. And that person would do an observation that identify really clear features that they wanted to look at. They'd have a chat about it afterwards. And then they teach that same lesson in the second person's classroom, building on that experience. What um, I noticed at the beginning, because teachers are conscientious people, um, is that this was actually becoming a bit unwieldy for them because they wanted to do these amazing lessons and, you know, they were coming up with these three-page documents for a 45-minute lesson. So, again, with the collaboration, we had to make sure that it was um, really clear and that they were able to use work that they were already doing. So at Daisyville, we collaboratively program. So stage meeting time is not admin time. It's time for the teams to sit together, talk about what happened in the lessons that week, what do we need to go to next, do we need to revise this, those sorts of things, and they program together. And I do want to make a little distinction, which was something that I learnt through the Learning Frontiers project about the difference between cooperation and collaboration. I think it's really easy for teachers to sit in a programming meeting and say, oh, I'm going to do the writing lesson. Great, I'll do a reading lesson. I'll do the art lesson and talk about collaborative programming. But actually, that's not collaboration. That's cooperation. We're working together. We've agreed that we'll do different things. But there hasn't been any of this feedback. There hasn't been any questioning. There hasn't been any reflection. So those are the sorts of things that are really important in collaboration. Um, so with the, the teachers that are working on the maths program, you know, we then talked about the fact that actually, why don't they just use a maths program that they've already collaborated on? That lesson would be really good. And then it means that the other people on their team are also learning from there. So there's that kind of broader sharing happening. Um, so I guess in terms of the lessons that are ongoing for me, and obviously nothing is ever perfect, um, I've kind of identified two aspects of support, and they're quite similar to what um, Tracy was suggesting. One of them is structural support. So for this collaboration to happen, we need time. Collaboration is hard, and it is time consuming, and it is, it is messy. It's much easier for me to write a maths lesson, to go and teach it in my room, and then to go on to the next one. Great. Um, but it's not as rich. So I'm not getting any feedback from anyone else. I'm not having um, any new ideas thrown at me. I'm not improving my practice. But for that to happen, we need time. And at the moment, we don't have that time. So we don't have a guarantee. Quality teaching successful students is a, is a great bucket of money. But I don't have a guarantee for how long I'm going to get that money for. I don't have a guarantee about how it's worked out or how much I'm going to get. So it isn't something that, as a principal, I can rely on. Um, and I think as well, in terms of time, we need time for collaborative practices to develop. So it's not something that happens instantly. I can't throw that money at it and say, great, everyone in my school now collaborates. Because actually, even for teachers who have an existing relationship that know each other really well, developing collaboration is a, is a different set of skills, as, as Tracy was talking about. If teachers haven't ever really had to give feedback to a colleague, they, they need to know how to do that. They need to know how to ask useful questions that are, that are probing, that help that person to move on. They also need to learn how to accept that feedback and not take it personally and to see it as a way of building. So I think there's a, there's a, a need for us to, to slow this down and to, to know that if we want effective collaboration to happen, we have to be willing to put the time in and, and to wait, to wait to see the results, to give people time to to embed it and to really be comfortable with it. Um, and yeah, the other thing is around that professional learning. I think we talk a lot about team teaching at the moment, and I have seen team teaching and I have done team teaching, and sometimes it's just two people standing in the same room um, with, a, with a lot of extra children in there. So I think, um, I think if we don't teach people how to team teach, if we don't give them time to program collaboratively together to actually know that this is the lesson we're teaching, this is the part that I'm going to lead, this is, you know, you could ask this question, all of those sorts of things, which again, massively time intensive, it's not team teaching, it's just a bigger group of kids with two adults in the room. Um, so I think that's something really important to think about. And I think the, the idea that, you know, when we look at collaboration, we don't want it to be an extra. Um, and I did a little Twitter survey of what um, people thought about collaboration in schools. And that was the big thing. People want it. Teachers want to collaborate. But A, they need time. 
and B, it can't just be one more thing, it can't be one more meeting, it can't be one more conversation to have. It has to be embedded in the culture of a school and in the practice of the teachers in that school, supported by the leadership of that school, but fundamentally supported by the system. So um, I loved hearing what Tracy said. I'm looking forward to hearing from Cathy and Tony and from everyone else in the room. I know there's a lot of expertise in here, so thanks. Thank you so much, Michelle. And if I might invite Cathy up, please. Thanks, Lilla. I also wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, elders past, present, and um, acknowledge the work of uh, teachers and what they do to support Aboriginal students every day in their schools and support the teaching of the broader Aboriginal understandings to non-Aboriginal people. Very important and crucial work for our society. The first point I want to make is um, obviously the Centre for Professional Learning is inside the auspices of the Teachers' Federation. That's the union representing the teachers in public schools in New South Wales. And we have a deep and long-standing relationship um, with the teaching profession in public schools. We are linked very closely to them. It is a natural connection and um, uh, the profession trusts us. We are close to teachers and nearly every day across New South Wales there are teachers interacting with and being involved with Federation policy and activities at the school. And they're also involved in what's called local associations. There are groups of teachers in, in uh, geographical areas. And then those areas are represented in what's called a state council. And so there's lots of different layers of interaction. The close relationship with the profession means that the Federation is well placed to know what teachers need in the area of professional learning, or at least offer some advice about that. Federation advocates the primacy of professional um, judgment of teachers in determining the best way to deliver the curriculum to students in their school communities, and that there have been in the past clear system priorities for schools, such as through what we would say would be the old DSP or disadvantaged schools program or um, priority schools program. Um, that's just one example of how the system enveloped uh, teachers and school communities with uh, that are in need. Teachers were previously able to engage in appropriate and high quality professional learning to support them to deliver the curriculum and this need has not changed. What has changed is the capacity of the system uh, for um, system-wide priorities for teaching and learning and therefore support the provision of professional learning for the profession. Through what's called local schools, local decisions, which in New South Wales is a devolution to schools, a devolution process or agenda, the system or the department has, unfortunately, and not necessarily because of any the focuses of people within it, um, distanced itself from the profession. They have vacated the field, so to speak, in the areas of core business of teaching, and that is teaching and learning and professional learning. And this has left a vacuum to be filled. And the Federation established the Centre for Professional Learning when it went to a crisis point um, in relation to that. The Australian Education Union has a 2007 curriculum policy and it states, to ensure that high quality curriculum is accessible to all, it is vital that school systems ensure the availability of professional de development, sorry, development for teachers, which is appropriate, relevant and of high quality, including time and support for the enhancement of new curriculum. The Federation Centre for Professional Learning provides, provides high quality training and support for Federation members in a range of educational areas. The courses and conferences provide practical, tested and well-researched approaches to issues that face teachers every day at school. Uh, the well-researched aspect is important and essential as a bulwark against fads in education that come and go. The syllabus documents have been washed through the process of consultation and the profession through NESA, to New South Wales Education Standards Authority, and through what's called board curriculum committees have uh, washed, this pro washed the syllabus processes through. So the profession is represented on these NESA committees and uh, the Federation has school representatives on these uh, curriculum committees. So the teachers have been consulted in the development of the curricula of the syllabus documents. And these are the mandated documents for implementation. In an era of constant change, the syllabuses are an important constant and their primacy is invaluable, an important touchstone for the profession. 
The CPL offers uh, one day uh, Courses are often one day, but there are courses that occur over two days or three days, with time in between the days for participants to implement strategies and then return in subsequent days to work with other participants to develop in, um, things in an ongoing manner. The one-day courses are often part of a suite of courses, such as teaching visual literacy K-6, to or teaching poetry K-6, to teaching grammar, punctuation, vocabulary K-6, to and which are aimed to support the delivery of the English K-6 to syllabus, and in combination are a potent set of professional development experiences. Careful I'm not using the professional learning uh, one there. <laughs> um, the CPL aims to offer programs that are useful across the spectrum of a teacher's career, from early career to the experienced and leadership levels. Courses and conferences are conducted in person as well as online, and the scope of courses and conferences continue to concentrate on the current syllabus implementation and the rollout of the new syllabuses, including most recently the new Stage 6. And today I was in Blacktown with a whole group of teachers who were looking at the new extension uh, syllabuses for mathematics. Additionally, the CPL program will contain um, certain courses covering parts of the curriculum and learning across the curriculum, which we always do, such as Aboriginal education, environmental education, education and so on. The CPL um, courses are endorsed by the New South Wales Education Standards Authority and uh, we're able to provide um, professional development for proficient and highly accomplished teachers who are maintaining at that level. The Journal of Professional Learning and the Journal of Professional Learning podcasts are an online professional learning and podcasts that seek to enhance the quality of teaching and uh, of public education in New South Wales and Australia through practical articles and professional conversations with teachers. The journal and the podcasts are adjunct work to the Centre for Professional Learning and often arise from courses and conferences in the program. Reading the JPL articles and listening to the podcast can contribute to meeting professional learning goals through the performance and development framework, which is a framework in the Department of Education uh, System schools for teachers to set goals and to uh, try and um, navigate their way through professional learning. And um, it also can um, contribute to teacher identified hours for learning um, in terms of maintenance of accreditation. The Centre for Professional Learning adds an important extra dimension to the union's standing, both with its members and in the public domain. It boosts the morale of members and makes a positive contribution to Federation's ongoing efforts to raise the status of the teaching profession and promote public education system in the wider New South Wales community. The reach of the CPL has been significant, with 1,300 individual school work workplaces represented at CPL events in 27, uh, 2017, and I'll get the figures later at the end of this year for this year. But there have been but there are many providers with commercial interests and self-interests moving to the area of professional learning and the development of what is often fad-driven education programs and resources that have no research base. Deva um, devolution has fragmented the professional learning across the system and has crippled the department's capacity to develop whole-scale reform across the system. It is expected that in 2,200 public schools, somehow teachers will get the curriculum delivered. And unfortunately, this is the model of devolution. There is a loss of institutional knowledge and memory and experience and a loss of vital communication to and between schools. In relation to curriculum delivery, the horizontal connections between schools are breaking down and I think it's happening very quickly and the vertical connections to the system have disappeared. Michael Fullen in his paper, Choosing the Wrong Drivers for Whole School System Reform, April 2011, presented the argument that whole system reform is the name of the game and the drivers are those policy and strategy levers that have the least and best chance of driving successful school reform. He states that whole system success required the commitment that comes from intrinsic motivation and improved technical competencies of a group of educators working together purposely and relentlessly. And Fullen sort of also states that work works in uh, uh, the daily experience of teachers, peers working with peers in a purposeful profession that is effective at what it does. Um, if the quality of teaching of the teacher is the premier factor related to student learning, and if you want the whole system transformation, then it must be virtually all teachers who own the reform. So too many people are out there making money out of professional learning. Players are making a lot of money out of schools, and they never have to step across the threshold of classroom. The union is linked to the people who work in the classrooms. 
and the system should be too, and attempts to be. And there are good people in the department attempting to do work to continue those links and, and grasp back what might have been lost through devolution. Teachers should be trusted to deliver the curriculum. They should be put in charge. Teachers are in a unique position to be able to have expertise in the syllabuses and to be able to deliver these to suit the particular needs of the schools in their particular school communities. It is the view of the Australian Education Union that the formulation of, of effective education policies cannot be achieved without substantial and ongoing input from those educators who are involved in the daily tasks associated with ensuring that students have every chance to learn and grow to their fullest extent. And it was noted by the director of the OECD's program for international student um, assessment, PISA, and I'm probably saying this wrong, but Andreas Schleicher, one thing is clear, where teachers are not part of the design of effective policy and practices, they won't be effective in their implementation. Education needs to do more to create a teaching profession that owns its professional practice. When teachers feel a sense of ownership over their classroom and their profession, when students feel a sense of ownership over their learning, that is when productive learning takes place. And when teachers assume that ownership, it is difficult to ask more of them than they ask of themselves. So the answer is to strengthen trust, transparency, professional autonomy, and the collective culture of the profession all at the same time. And this was the Australian Education Union submission to the review to achieve educational excellence in Australian schools. And as Alila said, is commonly known now as Gonski um, too. The AU identifies a range of core areas central to improving the capacity of this country's education system and attaining positive social outcomes in education and society. Quality teaching, including fully qualified te teachers, systemic support for teachers, continuous professional development, teachers having control over their profession, student-centred um, teaching and sustainable workload. Quality teaching, safe and inclusive schools, workforce force planning, addressing supply and demand, initial teacher education, very topical today in the press, two-year postgraduate degrees followed by three-year initial degree, um, capping total enrolments, minimum entry standards, tr strengthening and raising the status of practicum component. Effective systemic direction and support, strong systemic support for schools, school leaders, teachers, educational support, employers responsible responsibility for the provision of high quality professional learning. Intimately linked to all of these facets of quality education system are the basic principles of system equity and system and systemic resourcing and this is coming out of the AU's paper. The Federation, through establishing and having the CPL, is seeking to enable the voice of the profession to be heard and to restore these links between schools and the system. We are seeking to ensure there are common messages and ideas across the system. There needs to be a restoration of the capacity of the system of the Department of Education to have a leading role in the delivery of curriculum and the provision of professional learning. Currently, there are 104 or thereabouts people employed in CC, the Centre for Education, Statistics and Evaluation, and only a handful of very dedicated people employed in curriculum and practically no one in teaching and learning. How can the Department of Education know what is happening in schools? Um, they only know anecdotally. The department should be ensuring that there are common messages instead of the idea of 2,200 schools choosing their own adventure in terms of uh, through the um, devolution processes and being vulnerable to the commercial interests of edgy businesses and private providers of professional learning and supposed education programs developed in the absence of a research base and design. We need to rebuild the capacity for support. For example, if the Department of Education wanted to ensure the transition of students from preschool and early childhood education into kindergarten, they could deploy teachers teachers, into consultancy positions, probably the uh, middle uh, range teachers, into consultancy positions to work with designated schools to support this to occur. The consultants would be assisted with the linking of schools, the horizontal connections between the schools and the link to the systems, the schools to the system and the department as a whole, the vertical connections. This could occur to support the implementation of the syllabuses across the um, key learning areas and the economy of scales of the Department of Education would come into play and be cost effective. Programmatic based, programmatic based, so important, and would respond to teachers' needs as they set priorities for their schools' communities within this framework. 
This requires a huge investment of resourcing into the system. We believe all schools should be properly resourced to meet the unique needs of every child and to help them to re their, reach their potential. We're speaking up, and I'll get political, against the Liberal National Governments in Canberra's 1.9 billion, 1 1.9 billion funding cut to public schools that will leave 87% of public schools below the minimum level of funding required to meet the educational needs of children. So take that in. $1.9 billion cuts. It's a couple of submarines, folks. The AU submission to the review to achieve educational excellence in Australian schools also said the following. There's all these recommendations for professional development. Recommendation 10, that a systemic approach to continuous teachers' professional learning is essential and should provide opportunities for collaborative, collaborative professional development within and between schools. Recommendation 11, that greater systemic support should be provided for early career teachers with resources provided for mandated mentoring, induction, mandated, mandated, mentoring, induction, ongoing professional learning. This support must be timely. Release for both the mentor and the early career teacher. Recommendation 12, that research, research into effective pedagogy should be undertaken by systems and incorporated into professional development programs. These programs must be relevant and of high quality, including time and support for the implementation of professional learning in schools. Recommendation 13, the greater systemic support and improved access to continuous professional development for school leaders and particularly new principals is crucial to, crucial to build and maintain effective educational leadership and must be supported. And also the, uh, uh, this uh, submission said that central and regional offices must ensure that educators have access to frequent, high quality, collaborative, professional development opportunities that staff levels are sufficient to facilitate without the need for increased class sizes or grade splitting. Ensuring that all schools, including those in remote and regional areas, have equal access to professional development in the key role of Department of Education. The Centre for Professional Learning has Sydney Metropolitan and Regional New South Wales courses. Uh, we have courses held in the Central West, the Riverina, the Hunter, the Northern Rivers, the New, Eng New England area, the Illawarra, the Mid North Coast, the Central Coast. The teachers attending the CPL courses link with other teachers in the area, in the regional areas, and um, collaborate collaborate in an ongoing air, um, manner, either by sharing resources or creating friendships. This is particularly positive for secondary teachers who might be the only subject-specific teacher in a geographical area that is huge. These teachers link with others. Example, I noticed after we'd been to a course that uh, geography teachers in neighbouring rural schools were connecting after they'd been to courses. And this means uh, they're actually a couple of hours driving distance apart or three to four hours driving distance apart. So a teacher in Cobar linking with a teacher in Parks and what that may have meant to them we'll never know. Like the dripple, a ripple of a pond, uh, the pond in a, the pebble in a pond and the ripple of that coming out. So the AU also recommended that their improved access to ongoing professional development is also crucial to build and maintain effective educational leadership. And the CPL has been trying to develop support and support teachers in leadership positions or aspiring leaders, and that's include a practical approach to um, implementing what's called our performance and development framework, effective decisions for successful school leaders, leading and lifting um, achievement years uh, seven to 12, and they're just a few. The AEU um, also recommended the following in relation to professional development um, in terms of um, mentors. The CPL has offered um, support to um, teacher mentors and I actually met Tony um, in relation to this when we worked with um, Sydney University a little bit on this matter and we've developed some things for early career teachers and teacher mentoring. And we have some online learning as well going on but it's not in isolation, it actually has a, a lecturer or a practitioner who's delivering the online learning, it's ongoing and there's contact between the uh, participants and that person and there's ongoing learning, it's not a one-off. So feedback from our um, evaluation shows that there's um, the PLs range, uh, the implement, they say that they're <laughs> Um, grateful for the implementation, they're grateful for building their capacity and they can return to school as uh, with more confidence and advocates for what should be happening according to their um, professional judgment and that they're we're hoping that the CPL is a bulwark against unproven trends in education and um, education is being promulgated in public school communicators, communication, uh, sorry, the CPL is a bulwark against unproven trends in education 
being promulgated in public school communities and inflicted upon our students. Teachers are supported to be experts in their field and therefore more able to work collaboratively with colleagues to deliver the curriculum. And significant resourcing is required to implement all of the above. Current federal funding arrangements will leave nearly nine in 10 public schools in Australia without enough funding to meet the needs of each student by 2023. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Never left wondering what she thinks. May I now invite Tony up? Thank you. There's a bit of promo for what's coming up next. And this is about the, the continuing conversation and teacher professional learning. So um, these are not one-off events. I know some of, the, some of you hardy people have been to all the events so far, so you get a stamp for making such a, a strong investment in your own professional learning. I know it's not easy for you guys to come after a long, hard day's work, which might have started at six or seven in the morning or early with a long commute, and then you've come here and it's a dreadful place to find parking. Uh, public transport's hard with the light rail, so I, I really honour your effort for coming this evening. I think we've got the gender proportion right tonight. So if you count our, our, our great chair, I'm one out of five, which is about the right proportion for our profession. So, and, it, and it's, it's fitting that uh, my much more talented female colleagues went first and, and I'm last. And that's for good reason, because all these guys forget more than I'll ever know about the profession. You know, you've got three outstanding principals here. Cathy was Principal Villawood North. East. East. I got the wrong compass direction. <laughs> Mary Lance High School. Um, Michelle's currently the boss of Daceyville, uh, long-standing AP at, at Camdenville. And so they've been doing the hard yards. I, you remember Obama's speech back in, oh God, I'm getting old now, 2008, was it, Catherine? Um, Make hope possible rather than despair convincing, a nice quote from Raymond Williams. Uh, what I'm constantly reminded by of working with, with, Kath, with Kathy, with Michelle, with Leela, and also my wonderful friend Tracy, is about making hope possible. All these guys do the hard work. I remember I was there when Cathy started the Centre for Professional Learning. It was out of nothing. You know, the Federation didn't have anything to do with the Centre for Professional Learning. Cathy said, we'll do it, we'll grow it. And now, what, five, six years on, it's, it's, a, it's a booming business. And it's, it's taking TPL to the regions and to the teachers that need it. And it's extremely cost effective as well. So I, I honour that journey. Um, Michelle, I've seen you work at Learning Frontiers with, at Camdenville. Um, I got a message today from Michelle. I'm going to disclose this. Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> she said, I've spent half the day chasing kids around the playground. Um, and I said, that's, just, that's credibility. That's credibility. <laughs> it's also exercise. But the, what we get principals to do, it's not, a, it's not a full-time job. It's a full and a half-time job. And it, it's amazing. And anywhere in the corporate world, they'd be paid about five times as much. It's, it, it's an amazing job you do. So I honour your work. Um, so this is coming up for the Gonski Institute feel free to enrol. I also want to make the point that there's also a perspective paper. So when you enrolled today, you might have got access to a PDF. So that was part of the, it, like that, and I, like that. I was going to do a Frank Underwood and say, oh, I don't need my notes, I'm, I have all the audience. Um, they're my notes. There's a perspective paper on the website. And, and, and that was an act of collaboration. Just have a look on, the, uh, on that quote. If you substitute or put next to teacher, teacher researcher collaboration, you'd have what I think are the goals of the Gonski Institute. I know Adrian's not here, so I'm stealing his thunder, and Parsi's not here, so I've jumped into the, into the vacuum. And I'm saying that if, if you just substitute teacher researcher, that's what I think the Gonski Institute should be doing. That's collaboration. Collaboration between teachers and researchers. And that's the space that Gonski needs to work in. We are not the Grattan Institute. We are not social ventures. Yeah? We're not a think tank. We're not the Centre for Independent Studies, thank God. Um, we are the Gonski Institute where we invite a collaboration and a conversation between evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. That's the space we work in. Yeah? And, and that's what a university, a group of eight university can do. It can provide you with the research, the evidence base, but that evidence base is not worth a fig unless you match it with the practice-based evidence. Um, my, my wonderful colleague, Tracy Dirksen, is emblematic of what a university can offer. Uh, top 
uh, university PhD graduate. Her supervisor, Rob Clarsons, does the situated judgment work in the European Union. He's coming out, by the way, at the end of the year, and he's well worth talking to. Um, so Tracy has won a competitive postdoctoral uh, research fellowship to work in Andrew Martin's lab, which is incredible. You know Andrew Martin's work. Um, so th these are the sort of top people we get. And we talk about the middle in the school. Well, Tracy's the meritorious middle of the university. We can put a lot of resources behind our research efforts. They're the clever people. By the time you get old and grey like me, you're running around doing all the admin work. Yeah, and, you're, and you're, you have the pleasure of supervising wonderful PhD students, honours students, and working with postdoctoral colleagues. There's the brains trust right there. Yeah? Young, extremely bright, you know, wonderful experience, great researcher. They're the sorts of people that a university can mobilise in terms of practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice. That's what the Gonski Institute's about. OK. I want to make some points. Oh, I should mention Alberta first. Why is it that it's always cold countries that become shining lights, you know? We had Finland before and, yeah. and now it's Alberta. More time inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, why can't it be Costa Rica next? <laughs> I'll be putting my hand up to visit. So, um, But I'm glad that we're getting some wisdom from Alberta. Um, I'd also like to talk about what Cathy, um, the political points Cathy made and it's Susan Granwater-Smith running around my head at the moment talking about Habermas. Every time someone talked about neoliberal governance of schools, uh, Susan would be talking about Habermas and she'd say, you have to go back to the critical theorists. And she would bang me over the head with a book. You know, I'll knock some sense into you yet, Lachlan. Um, and Habermas talked about the crisis of legitimation, which is modern neoliberal governments um, are about accountability rather than governing. So they're very good at setting targets. And they're actually very good at outsourcing those targets as well. And that's, and that's when you get that situation that Kath has really pointed out, which is they're very hands-off. They're very hands-off in terms of professional learning. And that invites other commercial players in that space, which may or may not be a good thing, unless you've got really good licensing involved. But modern governments tend to set targets, tend to, tend to be audit governments that make us accountable, rather than being involved. And in professional learning, that can be problematic because you do need to have a very strong sense of what's happening at the practice level in order to do uh, effective teacher professional learning. Um, I was going to mention the story about ATAR this morning, but I think I'll leave that one alone. I think I've had enough thinking about that today. Uh, two other constructs I'd like to put up is the, ideas of, uh, the idea of innovation and implementation. So this is also aligned with the, with the modern neoliberal state. We tend to, I'll be careful in my words here, privilege the politics rather than the policy. Um, when a new innovation comes along in education, there's a lot of PR work done with it. Um, and sometimes that seems like a lot of PR spin. And maybe the evidence is in it, maybe it's not. But what it means in terms of teacher professional learning is that sometimes it seems the efforts put to the innovation and promoting the innovation rather than the implementation. And this is another space where the Gonski Institute is ideally positioned. And I think implementation science, which is practised in successful education systems like Singapore and Hong Kong, worry less about the innovation and more about the implementation. Yeah? So it's not whether this innovation is the greatest thing in the world, or it's, it's blessed, it's come from Hattie, or should, shouldn't say that, visible learning, or it's come from Jenny Gore. They, they care less about that than a theory of action and a process of implementation. Can you just bear with me for, for an example? Um, I'm old enough to remember when the quality teaching model was introduced into New South Wales. I think it was 2002, 2002, three. And I remember the videos came out. That's when we still had VHS. That's how old I am. Um, it was probably beta video, but it was no, a VH videos <laughs> came out and you, were, and you had to learn how to code. So the research measure that the productive pedagogy people used in Queensland, the 1800-odd classroom observations, the authentic pedagogy stuff from Wisconsin, that was translated into a professional learning tool, which was, you do what the researchers did. Now, this is 2003. That's like 15 years ago. There wasn't much of a culture, especially where I was working, of classroom observation. 
And we were asked to do the training videos and score our colleagues. Just to think of that for a little while. We weren't even watching each other teach. You know, you close the door. Teaching, as someone famously said, was the second most private thing you did in your life. Um, but no, there was not a cultural observation in teacher professional learning, but yet we were being asked to score each other. Now, in many places where I worked, and I was out in the, in, in the bush at the time, I was working at Charles Sturt at Dubbo, so my quality teaching partnership school was West Wylong, the wonderful principal there, Marilyn Peach. Um, we didn't do, end up doing much of the scoring in the classroom. We, we put a lot of our effort on that project on planning and assessment tasks and evaluation, yeah? But the whole plan, teach, evaluate cycle wasn't done in an authentic way because we left the teach bit out. It was too politically dangerous. You didn't go into a school where there was no professional learning culture and say, guess what, folks? I'm going to come in your classroom today and score you on the 18 elements. Uh, uh, no, that wasn't going to happen. But we had some really good conversations around planning and around coding assessment tasks. Now, now just cast your mind forwards now. Jenny Gore has done you know, like almost two decades of work in this area, but she now the quality teaching model has a theory of action to go with it, which she's borrowed from you know, Harvard and instructional rounds. So it's called quality teaching rounds, yeah? And so it's got a little bit of lesson study in there, a little bit of instructional rounds. So now you've got the quality teaching model, which is a validated uh, research instrument. Jenny's done the evidence. She's got the randomised control trials. She's done the hard work. God bless her. That is just an incredible amount of work. 20 years of classroom-based research, you need to be resilient and tough. Once again, one of my very talented female colleagues who've done the hard work, smart, talented, hardworking, diligent. She's done the hard yards, stuck the journey. But the, the secret was aligning that beautiful, strong quality teaching framework model to a process, a theory of action. How will this work? In the quality teaching uh, rounds model, it is eight people get involved in a professional learning study group, yeah? And they each have to commit to teaching a lesson. That's the commitment thing, Kath. So they, each one of these people who are involved in this project have to cross the threshold and teach a lesson and give each other feedback. Now, Jenny hasn't pulled away from the score. In order to get the measurement and evaluation data, she still needs a scoring mechanism, but everyone's accountable and everyone has to have a, have a turn. And when they have the, the post-lesson conference, each person gets a chance over the whole year, so there's eight people in the group, right, so you imagine two per term, they say, I gave you a three for intellectual quality and this is why, yeah? The reasons, you have to back, you have to back up your score. So this, quali uh, the quality teaching model rounds together, 17 million from the Paul Ramsey Foundation, bang, you got a sweet spot, yeah? But it didn't happen by accident. Jenny's done 20 years of hard work. You might be thinking now, is there one model? No? Should everyone be just doing the quality teaching model? Uh, I was at a, a, a meeting yesterday with some of my, my principal friends and they said, what is it about you educational researchers? What is it? You, you always say it's complex. There's lots of different answers. Can't you just give us one thing? You Don't you realise how busy we are? <coughs> Today I've dealt with this, this and this. It's 8 o'clock and I've dealt with 85 things already. Now I've had the police on my front doorstep, yet you come in and say, it depends. It's like, oh, no wonder we hate you guys, you know? Why don't we, we spend $8 million for, to bring in overseas people all the time, you know? The, the cargo cult of educational research. There's always someone brighter from overseas. Um, because we can't give straight answers, you know? We don't say there is one model and you should stick to it. So while we've got Jenny Gore's QTR stuff going at the moment, backed up by the $17 million of Paul Ramsey Foundation money, we've also got visible learning rolling on down nearby a school near you, yeah? Yeah? And then another model, I might, I might go to another school and they might be using Harvard Instructional Rounds or Visible Learning, you know, visible, not Visible Learning, Visible Thinking, yeah? So that really drives people crazy that there's no standardisation. But I don't mind that. It's, it's, some people deride it as a thousand flowers blooming. I don't care so much about the innovation, I care about the implementation. All those ideas are proven. The visible learning stuff out of, out of Hattie's work is there. It's got the evidence. You can't argue with the evidence there. You can't argue with, with the work out of Project Zero in Harvard. You can't argue with, with uh, Jenny Gore's work, the quality teaching model. It's all solid stuff. But it's successful when there is a strong implementation model, fidelity of implementation. The, the best professional learning models in the States, uh, the class model is the best, which Tracy's trained in 
out of, the, out of uh, Virginia, University of Virginia, yeah, Robert Pianta and his colleagues, they ensure fidelity of implementation by making sure everyone is certified to be an observer with the class instrument. And you have to recertify every year, Trace? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every year you have to go back in there and your coding has to be as close to the master rater as possible, yeah? Mm -hmm. Otherwise you don't get the ticket. Yeah. And that's how you protect your fidelity implement implementation, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you want everything, where's, where's, where's it, where am I going with this? Focus on the implementation, yeah? Focus, if the innovation is research-based, that's fine. Focus on how you're going to do the implementation work. Um, and one way to think about that is when you're doing professional learning, think about are you using a research measure, are you using an evaluation measure, or are you using an improvement measure? Now, the literature's there in this the, from uh, the Carnegie Foundation. They call it learning improvement science. In another branch, it's called implementation science. There's not much between the two, right? So if you want to follow up the references later on, um, Alma Harris writes in this area, Michelle Jones, the, the paper I cite in this position paper here is from their study 2014. So think of implementation science or learning improvement science. They make a distinction between research measures, between improvement measures and evaluation measures. So I've already given you an example about research measures. When we uncritically try to translate the quality teaching measurement instrument into professional learning, it wasn't as successful as it might as it might have been, yeah? Because we didn't put money and thought into the implementation. I could have told them after day one at West Wyalong that it wasn't going to work, that we're going to score each other, yeah? Marilyn Peach told me pretty quickly, no, Tony, this school's not ready for this, yeah? But we're ready to sit down and have a yarn about the 18 elements, yeah? And to you, for you to give us some feedback as a critical friend on our assessment processes and our, and our plans. Look, take the next point. What about evaluation measures? So in your, in your school, if your teachers get a sniff that you're evaluating them under the guise of professional learning, they won't touch it, yeah? So the, uh, the practice continuum designed by Patrick Griffin, University of Melbourne, which is the ATSEL continuum, yeah. It's six levels, and the, the six levels are interesting in themselves, but What's very interesting is about the 80 pages of protocols that Patrick and his colleagues have put in there. Please do not present this as an evaluation tool, as part of people's performance review. Use it and make sure it's been shown to be used as a professional learning tool. That's called an improvement measure. An improvement measure closes the feedback loop between the actual measurement, whether that's a discussion in the classroom or an observation, a looking at student work protocol, to the ensuing professional learning. And this fits very well with the growth model, right? It's a developmental growth model where knowledge is not fixed and we move into next steps all the time. Small measures, observations, feedback, where you're going next. It works beautifully and it fits with how people understand the growth model to be about. So improvement measures, pragmatic measures that teachers can see are being used to enhance their professional practice. That's learning, learning improvement measures. And that's the sweet spot that we're trying to get. Um, I'll finish with one last point. And that is this idea, and, I, and it came up when Michelle mentioned it in our paper, about the idea of curation rather than creation. And I love this point because there are so many fantastic ideas out there. Um, and the Learning Frontier stuff, from my naive understanding, we actually did a lot more curation of existing resources and put them into a design framework, which was a theory of, of action from what I understood it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> I got you right. So it was not so much on finding the great new innovation, the shiny new object, it was curating the existing resources to be used um, in, the, in the Learning Frontiers program. And it was, it, and what struck me about the Learning Frontiers program from being involved from, or an outsider was the, the, the serious evaluation, ongoing evaluation of the program. Stacey Quince, who's a, who was on that program, is boss of Campbelltown Performing Hearts High School, has been very strong in evaluation of professional learning for many years. She worked with me on the quality teaching stuff years ago and we did the road, the road tour. And, and she had lots of really good evaluation devices that looked at how your professional learning was going 
And even before we started talking about impact, um, Stacey was on the money. Okay, so I've mentioned a few points here. I've mentioned the difference between innovation, implementation. Implementation is extremely important. I've looked at the contrast between practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice needs to be put together. Um, as Professor Dylan Williams says, everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. And that really irks people who like to standardise everything. <coughs> yeah? Um, and I'll leave you with one action. There's actually, there's actually something really interesting happening at the moment, which is the review of the uh, New South Wales curriculum, curriculum documents. That review is still open. And people, sometimes people get a bit cynical and we get very busy and we say, we, we might, we, I haven't got time to write a paper or, or contribute. Maybe you can get together with your colleagues in the subject area. Maybe you can get to your colleagues in the professional association. But write a review, because there's some very, very interesting um, ideas on the table that have come from Gonski 2 that's involved in that review. So if you look at the terms of reference, I've linked it from, from our paper, um, it needs our input, because that runs the danger of being an innovation rather than an implementation. Yeah? We need to actually agitate for resources to be put into implementation of whatever ambitious ideas that come out of the review. And I do hope they're ambitious ideas. But we need to really agitate for resources. Because we can have all the best ideas in the world if we don't think about the implementation through careful professional learning that involves both research and practice-based evidence. It'll be very, very challenging for us in the profession. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. And as I do that, the panel members are going to suddenly go and grab a red chair and move it across the right now so that we can do a Q&A se session on that. Thank you so much, Tony. And another um, guest speaker that we never left wondering what they're thinking. I just wanted to pick up on something that Tony said right at the beginning, and it was about hope. And um, part of the research base that's coming from the Gonski Institute is working with a whole lot of school educators. And one of them spoke the other day um, to me and just spoke about the fact that being part of that collaborative discussion for her was giving hope to the profession to move it forward with research and evidence, but it was working with a combined professional source of voice, which is fabulous. Just very quickly, some of the themes that I think that we heard coming through, and I know that you would have had multiple ones then, but was about the collective efficacy, about collective responsibility of educators to be part of this. And we talk about our agency is what is important through all of this process and where we continue. It's looking at efficacy, small teams within schools the larger team within a school, across schools. Those things are really, really important. But it's across sectors as well. And dare I say, it could be between sectors, which is another aspect that we might actually one day venture forward on. The greatest impact on student achievement and learning is about deliberate and identified scaffold-informed research, and that's what we need to look at and also about the actions that we take up from there. We need to support and facilitate teacher leadership. That was coming through. And we spoke about the mid-year career teacher. But how do we also empower and embrace those earlier in their career and those on the other side of the continuum later in their career? Because that's important as well with all of that. Um, how do I identify what authentic collaboration is? Because as we heard, we can sit in a staff meeting, we can sit in a team meeting, and we can share ideas, we can share time, but what makes it authentic? What are the elements there? These may be some of the burning questions that you're going to ask these panellists in a moment. Who knows? I won't go on with the, um, any more themes. I've got pages of them after that. Thank you so much. But I will open it up to the floor now. I've got a taker already. Thank you. I'm um, just standing here so you can hear me at the back. My name is Erika Zimmer. I'm a teacher and also a journalist for the World Socialist website. Um, this question goes to the topic both tonight and the topic last time, which was on assessment. And I'm, ta I'm getting the information from a, um, an article in the latest New South Wales Teachers Federation journal, which talks about a trial undertaken in hundreds of New South Wales schools 
the trial was, sorry I'm going to take off my glasses, the trial introduced learning progressions and online assessment tool we into schools. need to get to a question. Please. Well, I'm Thanks. going to ask all the panel to comment on that, on this, <laughs> this thing. So this is a, an online assessment tool that was introduced. It created excessive teacher workload, according to Karina Haythorpe, who's the president of the AEU. Um, the system is unworkable. Our members have reported being stressed and overwhelmed by the trial, etc., etc. Now, not only is this trial so you're being asking done, them to comment, comment on, on, on the learning yeah, progression. No, I'm asking them to. There's another point to this. Well, is we that, need one question at a time. So what would you like? To well, ask actually, the, the point is that that trial is in the past. Now the federal okay. government is planning so the question to question to the panel is, yes. would you like to make any comment? The federal Thank you government... For that. I'll just ask the panel. Would you like to make any comment on the trial of the learning progression? Well, I'm not sure if anyone's aware of it. The, um, and it hasn't been. Thank you. It's, yes. in, it's in Gonski 2.0. I just referred to it then. So, and I invited people to be active in their profession by responding to the NESA review. Um, NESA, the NESA Terms of Reference has referenced GONSI 2.0. You have heard um, uh, talk from de about developmental progressions, but, uh, but I think they're actually asking for a, a serious open debate. So I think we've, you've got a great opportunity um, to have your voice heard in the submission to the NESA review. Right. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, anyone else? A question from the floor? And if we could keep it to your short questions, that would be fabulous. I did actually ask what they thought of it, not that, you know, not that I should go and put my uh, implementation into Bonsky. So could you tell us what you think of these online learning progressions and the fact that apparently there's not going to be any professional development paid for for teachers? Thank you. And that's, we'll just leave it at that in terms of the question. Do we have any... I, I think... I think... Anything? Yeah. I, I never back down from that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, no, the, um, I, I think still think that the idea of development progressions needs to be needs to be thought through, and 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 that is part of public debate, public political debate, and that and that's what the NESA review is is doing at the moment. Um, the the idea of um, that you alluded to about will there be teach professional learning? I think that is all yet to be determined. I think they've still got to uh, go through the curriculum view and the proper processes and think. Uh, Developmental progressions or learning progressions are the way to go. Shall that, will that be an online process? What type of fresh learning will be involved in that? I don't think those questions are settled. I, I still think those questions are open and they're up for debate. And I have a lot of faith actually in, 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 the, in the current head of NESA in, in the con consultative processes. You know? So I, I think there's still room for debate. So the learning progressions um, are being released in New South Wales. It's the New South Wales um, replacement for the continuums. And there has been paid for professional learning for all schools to be able to access that. So that is happening. Uh, they're not mandatory. Um, there's lots of guidance around how schools can use them. The trial, um, that feedback that you refer to was given really clearly to the department. Um, and they've responded to that and adjusted the process for rolling out the progressions. I think um, Cass, Cass points around um, system efficacy was were, were well made in that um, when you look at um, best practice examples, which is mentioned in the uh, Harrison Jones et al paper about successful education systems, they're actually, um, I think it was the Hong Kong or Singapore example, I think it might be Hong Kong, where they talked about a leadership academy. So there is a, there is a, like a, a initial test to be a principal and there is a very strong six month program before you even enter the job. So I think the, the systems invest in people knowing about theories of action and implementation. And I, I don't know whether that answers your question, but um, it's something about that, the Grattan Institute paper 
was it John Goss? What's Peter Goss? Yeah. Peter Goss. And Peter Goss talked about um, adaptive systems and, and adaptive schools, and he talked about the incredible strength in having a large you know, schooling system, whether that's the Catholic Education Office, which is pretty large in New South Wales, uh, in diocese, but also the state system, which is huge, 15,000 15, odd teachers, or 50,000. 60,000. 60, there you go. And, but there's a, an awful lot of collective knowledge based in those schools. And I think, and this speaks to Kath's point a bit, I think we lost a bit of that when we went to schools of excellence in, in the school choice model, um, which was happening when I was teaching in that. Sometimes we've got a situation where schools who are both department schools are competing for each other and they, they see each other as, as commercial rivals for enrolments. And I think that's, yeah, that's disappointing when I say it. I also see plenty of schools working together as well in hybrid networks, but um, I think a, a greater sense of collective efficacy would be uh, across the system would be very powerful. Parsi's uh, texts on Finland really shine through there. Where, you, if, where you've got systems that you know, uh, are funded by different organisations, whether they're faith-based or school, but they're all coming under the, the Finnish system. And they, there is a big emphasis on sharing across schools rather than competing. I don't know whether that... Okay. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Thank you. My question is for Michelle. Uh, you spoke about team teachers and how one, one teacher would teach and then they'd get together and they would, in my words right, collaborate uh, and then improve on within a short amount of time on the next lesson. And my question is, having the short turnaround of reflective practice there, is that quite powerful relative to uh, teaching the curriculum one year, term one, week two, and then next year, term one, week two? I couldn't tell you what I taught last week, let alone <laughs> term one last year. Um, so yeah, look, I, I think it, it is powerful because it's connected and I think the, the bigger picture is around um, what comes out through those lessons. So it's not just about actually I've just improved that lesson, but it's about seeing, um, I can't think of the word, but kind of what the, to generalise, I guess. So to take from that actually, okay, so that worked in this lesson here. Um, might it also work in a literacy lesson if I'm doing differentiation that way? Um, so it becomes immediately applicable. I think the idea of holding on to something until I teach, you know, sundials again the next year is really difficult. Um, I think it happens. You know, I know that I've taught lessons and thought, whoa, never do that again, um, and, and taught it differently the next time. But, I, but yeah, I think that the turnaround helps the generalisation um, of, of the learning, I think, for the teachers, in my opinion. Anyone else want to take that up? Great. Don't adjust your glasses on your head. I think you want to ask a question. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I might just ask the panel. We've spoken a, a lot, and I know you only had 15 minutes, even though you were quite elastic with your time, but nonetheless. <laughs> and we did, what do you think, if you just had to give one or two, what are the strongest, strongest enablers and the constrainers of really strong collaboration within a school or across the system. If I could ask each one of you perhaps to comment on that. Constrainers. Um, so I meant to make a big deal of this in my presentation, but forgot. <laughs> so, go, Lilla. Um, I think um, the relationships. I think. Um, for schools to build within them, if, if your collaboration is happening within a school, that the teachers trust each other, that they have relationships where they can be honest um, and that we also don't try and force things. So, you know, in, in my example, I haven't been pairing up teachers who don't um, work together well. I haven't been preparing up teachers who don't know each other very well. There's been a degree of teacher autonomy and teacher choice around that. So making sure that we're building on strengths. Um, and in terms of constrainers, just time. That's the big one, I think. I was actually involved in the uh, National Schools uh, Network um, that was uh, in one of the 10 pilot schools and we did work around this um, and this was back in the 90s and we found that um, the enablers were um, trying to actually being very explicit about giving um, teachers support to be collaborative. So we developed protocols for uh, working together, for having discussions, because we were bringing together people who had varying um, degrees of experience and who 
we weren't an homogenous group, and that's not a bad thing. Um, but um, we had various opinions and strong opinions. And so it was a way of um, being able to have um, collaborative um, or professional discourse around teaching and learning, uh, and that evolved some explicit ways, and such as the um, protocols. So developing, um, being very explicit um, in the support for that. The constraints obviously were time, um, most definitely, um, but we overcame that by um, being able to have some um, scope to change our work organisation. So we're given some funding to do that. So we overcame that constraint through some funding to work together to um, work through work organisation. Another enabler was an academic partner. So it was actually Susan Groundwater Smith, a great enabler. Yes, <laughs> God. Uh, um, so a really important process. So something else explicit. Um, I. What I've learned, I guess, to go back to the Alberta model is um, what I think can be a really good enabler is that connection with the community and um, involved in whatever projects are happening or what the teachers are working on. So I think that is something that after their 14 years of uh, success that they still came away with is something that they think they could have um, utilized better was the community. Um, so I would see that as an enabler and constraint time that's always that comes up in the research that I've done it's always yeah there's just never enough time <laughs> uh, Susan's on my shoulder again and she's talking about Habermas's ideal speech situation which is everyone has equality in a, in a, in a, in a speech in a, in a conversation so everyone's got equal rights so the best professional partnerships I've worked in as an academic partner is when the teachers felt they were on an equal setting uh, to me and, they, and I wasn't some sort of expert coming in giving them a scripted program um, or being the university lecturer. So this is, I'm quoting now from Kennedy 2016, there's four different models of effective professional learning. Um, what doesn't work is giving someone a script and say you have to do it like this. What doesn't work are university courses, so there goes my <laughs> our business model out the window, bang. Um, the, two, the two strongest models, and one of them really surprises me, one doesn't. One's when the, uh, a model is introduced to the teachers and then they contextualise it to their area and they get a chance to do some action research, a bit like CAS courses where in between each module you get to do some action research. So that, that's very, very strong in terms of literature. Um, the other one is reading groups. Like, who would have thought the stuff I did at North Sydney Dem all those years ago? Um, reading groups really showed up strongly. And, I, and I'm saying both of those last two examples are empl emblematic of an ideal speech situation. When you're doing action research, when you're allowed to contextualise a model and question it and work with it, because, you know, the famous aphorism is all models are, are wrong, but some are, uh, some are useful, right? So we get to actually play that out. But the reading group is also sitting as, as professionals. So how often does a teacher who's, they're absolutely flogged in schools, you know, the, the workload gets more intense day by day. Um, but actually to sit down and be a professional and like you said, write case studies or do some readings is, is a really nice space to work in. Also what's handy, uh, open questions too, just some really broad open questions like what's, what's working and what's not working? Or what's working and what are the areas for further development? Two simple questions like that to open a discussion um, can be really useful. And then to identify something then small. Start small too, not trying to make everything change. Start with small things. And also identifying in a school, even if you've got a whole lot of people who, who are feeling time constraint and, and have um, who are just feeling they can't do anything different, find the couple of people who do want to do something different and let them do it. And you can gain momentum through that also. Dylan Williams said, um, it's a zero sum game, professional learning innovation. If you want to get people to do something new, take something away. So an admin meeting might be replaced by a professional learning meeting. That might be just one example. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. I thank you so much. I'm a volunteer teacher in Kensington uh, Public School. Can you hear him up the back? Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm also a parent of Kensington Public School. My question is, is there a possibility for communities, for school community members, such as parents, to be more involved into an open, transparent 
um, participatory process of teaching, support teachers, and being part of the teaching process. Because I'm seriously curious what happened in school. As a parent, I don't know too much. That's one of the reasons I want to be a part of one of the teachers. So I, I'm seriously uh, want to help teachers and help teachers to do a better teaching for the kids. I don't know if you have a Good question. Yeah. Show the <laughs> um, look, I think that is up to every school. I think schools have varying levels where, of where they feel comfortable in terms of having people in. I know um, most schools um, offer opportunities for parents to come and volunteer in different things, whether it be reading programs, whether it be classroom activities. Um, there is a degree of openness, how organised or um, kind of comprehensive it is, I guess, is up to the individual school and, and that would be a conversation for you to have with your child's teacher or the principal of that school. Um, but most teachers I know um, really welcome the support of parents and we want them to be in our classrooms and helping the students because we know that um, that's really powerful for the children to see, their parents being part of the learning process, but it also gives parents um, extra information that they can take home to use to then support their child at home. The Disadvantaged Schools Program in New South Wales um, and its research base pro, um, was very strong in the messages about the congruence between home and school and how the research showed that that needed to be in existence for improved student learning outcomes. And as Michelle said, that's contextualised with um, each school community, but was very strong. And this is where the point we've been trying to make or, uh, about the system taking responsibility um, to support those processes through the Disadvantaged Schools Program back then. Um, there were parent groups um, very explicitly formed at a state level and then at regional levels and at community levels. Uh, these processes were supported explicitly by the Department of Education. And out of that research came principles, LES, principles of operation for what worked um, in terms of partnerships with parents to improve student learning outcomes. Sorry, I just want to add, <laughs> you know, why not? Um, <laughs> I think that um, there might be some caution in teachers and I think if we're thinking about how we support the profession, I think that often as, as a school leader and as a teacher, we feel a bit vulnerable because sometimes parents um, might take things they see out of context or might take it to the media and, and teachers and principals get um, not a great rap sometimes in um, on Facebook or in the news and those sorts of things. So I think... Um, there might be some caution in schools, and I think actually that's probably fairly reasonable. Um, I think, you know, you're, you're going in with an open mind, you generally want to help your, your child. It's difficult for schools to know that that's what every parent's motivation is. And so I think if we're thinking about supporting the profession, it is important that teachers feel comfortable with having parents in their classrooms and they don't feel pressured to do that. But there's also some really clear guidelines for parents around what that's going to look like. Congratulations on volunteering at local school, that's great. Kenzo Public is a great school. I ride my bike past there all the time. It looks fantastic. Um, I, your really insightful question reminded me about um, student voice as well. So there's parents who sometimes forgotten as a stakeholder, but students are the consequential stakeholders of education. So, And, and I just realised in all this paper I, di I didn't mention student voice. So. Um, um, there is some excellent work on student voice. Once again, Susan Grandwater Smith, listening to learn, learning to listen text, which was produced about 12 years ago now. But um, Susan built a whole professional learning network based on student voice, and she'd go into schools and then they'd say, "What, what are your challenges? What are your problems of practice?" And she'd say, "Let's ask the kids," mm -hmm. and and the kids not only were just uh, consulted in 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 a, in a way, they were actually part of the changes, and so there was incredible reform. So. Um, I know the New South Wales uh, Department just got the Tell Them From Me survey. And there's some interesting data that says he did some says he did some interesting correlations with the Tell Them From Me survey. So you know they found like things like where kids are happiest, they do better in schools. Like, yeah, but there's no, I shouldn't. This, but there's a, there's an enormous amount of data out there, and sometimes it's forgotten. And and I just realised my own gap then when when you asked that very insightful question. So thank you. Just stop there unless someone has a really pressing question. I'm not going to thank the panel yet because we have two slides. So just the first one is this one that Tony was referencing, and this is um, obviously the beginning of a conversation where we have the affirmation and the contribution and the collaboration 
of those in partnership with education. So, of course, that means parents as well are more than welcome. But this PL is the beginning of forging what we can do into the future, and it is to meet the needs of educators in all schools across all sectors, which is really important. And that's part of working across sectors or between sectors. I've never been told I can't be heard. I can't believe that, but thank you. So that's one aspect of it. So please um, consider going to it. It's at four different venues. And as you can see, some pretty in impressive speakers there. And it was not easy getting all of them onto the one program, I can assure you, but we've done that. And the last thing is the next one of our public events is on the 27th of November and it's looking at how will we lay the foundation for early learning. It's not yet ready for registration but it will be soon so please consider that as well because your participation in these forums is really vital for us moving forward. Now I'd like to thank the panel. <laughs> I think um, we've had some really lively presentations. The concepts have been either affirming and or provocative, which is fabulous on, on, of a panel. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. I would like us to thank Michelle, Tony, Cathy and Tracy. May we have a round of applause for great presenters today. And may I thank you, it's been a pleasure chairing this evening with the panellists, but of course with um, the participants here and we hope to see you on the 27th or at any one of these venues close to you. Thank you so much. Safe travel.